Now I'm a retired auto worker. I spent 40 years in the auto plants around the city of Detroit uh, trying to get 30 years. So uh, I feel fortunate to be here now to try to talk about some of that history and some of the lessons that need to be carried on and learned, you know, from, from my lifetime. Yeah. So, so, so one of the uh, mm -hmm. really big things that, that you recognize for uh -huh. is your involvement in drum. Could right, you, right. Could you describe what, what, jump, what drum was and yeah. the purpose of drum? Yeah, uh, drum was the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement. And it was named that because we organized at the Dodge factory where we made the Dodge car. Uh, so the Enemon Dodge Revolutionary Union movement became automatic. We knew we had to have an organization at that plant. We were not going to be nobody's cause. We were going to be caught up in the caucus activity of the shop. We wanted something independent. We knew likewise we were going to be revolutionary because we lived in revolutionary times and the kind of conditions that we worked under forced us to be revolutionary. So therefore, we became the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, a small group of people at the Hamtramck Assembly Plant. We started off with nine people in a plant that employed 10,000. So you can see what a tremendous job we had to do in terms of organizing that factory. You know? uh, what were some of the things that, that Drum, uh, some of the actions that Drum took? Uh, uh, first, we, 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 uh, uh, we used my case. Uh, I was discharged uh, for participation in the Wildcat strike on the afternoon shift in May of 1968. And we kind of knew that after I was discharged, it was uh, seven people discharged all, all, all together. It was a set of five white women and two blacks, myself and Benny Tate, and about 30 other people disciplined because we walked out because of a speed up on the afternoon shift. And we figured that uh, when they came back to settle the discipline, that we were going to get set up. They were going to try to put the brunt of the wildcat strike on our shoulders. You know, so, I, so we was prepared. We met each other during the strike. You know, wildcat strike is an important strike because everybody comes to work, don't know if you're going in. And when you don't go in, you got all this time to hang out. So I, I got a chance to meet people from the other side of the plant on the seventh floor, and I'm on the third floor on the front side. I got a chance to meet a core of people and began to talk and all of us you know had different kind of opinions but one thing that we understood quickly that the people on the other side of the plant didn't know why we walked out on this side you know uh, we stayed over after the afternoon shift and waited for day shift to come in and set up a picket line and day shift stayed out too so that strike went on like that for four days we go every day because you don't know whether you're going in or not so you get a good hangout time and you talk and for four days that strike went on and we finally been, went back to work. But we figured that that I was going to get discharged because I had a lot of uh, community activity on me too and I knew I was hot on the totem pole. So uh, when they finally called us back in for, for discipline, they, uh, they brought the five women that was discharged back to work and left me and Benny Tate out in the street to suffer the consequences. Mm -hmm. And that's when we decided we need to organize drum. Mm -hmm. And we need, decided that we need to organize drum on the basis of putting out a weekly leaflet that would discuss the biggest problems we have in that plant each week. And we, and we decided to do that because we found out how, how, how things get this so distorted from one end of the plant to the other that we're not all on the same issue. And that's how we kind of got started with drum. We started get drum on organizing of a flyer that we would get together on Sunday and write and distribute it every Tuesday, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what plant was that exactly? That was at the Hamtramck Assembly Plant of Chrysler Corporation, mm -hmm. properly known as Dodge, Maine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I once worked at the uh, Hamtramck Assembly Plant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Back okay. when I was a college student. I yeah. Was over the summer. Uh, okay. All yeah. right. Okay. In, yeah. in the uh, me in the uh, uh -huh. Metal department. And okay, I, yeah, I, I it was 9110. Yeah, yeah, 9110. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, uh -huh. I had some great experiences there. Okay. But I, one of the other things I want to ask you about <laughs> was uh, 
at, at one point you had to go underground. Oh yeah. Could you could you explain the situation that what that situation was? <laughs> yeah, let, let, let me say this. Uh, it wasn't right away. Uh, we uh, uh, we ended up uh, agitating uh, at that plant every week. You know, like I say, with a weekly leaflet, and um, people in the plant started demanding that we've been. Y'all yeah, been talking, when are we going to take some action? So we figured we had to do something, man. I mean, people were calling our, calling our stuff to question. Uh, so we, we sat out and went over all the, the nine different uh, flyers we put out and talked about the serious issues that was raised in each one. And we wrote up a list of demands based on these issues. So our, internet, our local executive board used to meet during the week and we took about 200 people down to the executive board meeting and read off a list of demands. Um, uh, they looked at us and said they weren't going to do nothing about the stuff. And arguments went on, and one of our guys hollered. I said, well, we're going to strike the plan in the morning. And everybody stormed out. So we stuck now. Yeah. We weren't prepared, but we stuck. Uh, so we went back. We had a little coffee shop then on Grand River called the Ghetto Coffee Shop. And we used to have conga players in there uh, and chess stuff, and, and they, they play all night long, you know. So we organized all of them, you know. Took the conga drums out to the plant the next morning. Set up the conga drums at the plant, and the brothers started beating them drums, and we started <laughs> agitating and calling. And we looked up, man, in a half hour, we had 3,000 black workers in the street and didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> didn't know what to do with them because uh, the state troopers were on top of the plant with high-powered rifles. Mm -hmm. The Hamtramck Police Department was coming from the north, and the Detroit Police Department coming from the south, kind of getting us in a pincher movement. Uh, they had double-edged axe handles, and we got guys in the alley breaking off beer bottles and stuff that, that this, this fight here, we're going to lose. You know, so we quickly put these guys into cars and drove them over to Chrysler World Headquarters and set up a picket line over there went to Solidarity House, set up a picket line over there to diverse the situation. Then we came back to the plant, and that strike went on, you know, for about four days before they came to us with an injunction. They came with us an injunction, forcing us to go back to work. So we went back to work the following week. The strike was over, but right after that strike, man, uh, Chrysler came out and declared that strike to be extra legal, not illegal. Yeah, Unprecedented, because they didn't know what to do with us, man. Here's a black strike at a plant that's majority black. They ain't never had no shit like this before, and they didn't know how to play it. So uh, behind that, our workers started coming from everywhere. The Eldon plant was the next crew that came and said, look, man, we, we need a drum over here. And our attitude about it was like this, man. We, listen, we can't handle your stuff at your plant. But here's what we got. We got ink. We got, we got, we got a mimeograph machine. Uh, we can print leaflets. We got paper. I, we, I got a group of high school kids that'll help pass your stuff out. But I'm not going in your plant. You write it. You type it. We'll help you run it, and we'll get it out. So that was our attitude. We could not accept the editorial policy of somebody else's plant. Not when we still working at Dodge Main and catching hell ourselves. So what happened was that Eldon jumped off. After about nine weeks of passing our leaflets at Eldon, that one jumped. You know, uh, 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 they called for a strike, man. And we sh well, but this time we decided to have a one-day strike. Not a strike that's open-ended because you can't control it. So we had a one-day strike. Uh, and when well, they came at us this time, they fired 25 people. We go back to the office, our little drum office, uh, after the midnight shift, and Kenny Cockle called the office and they asked for me. They always call, they always call me Jen. He said, Jen, Chrysler got the judge out of bed, and they have a court at midnight and they want you. I said, well, damn, Ken, what should I do? He said, well, if I was you, I wouldn't be all that available. I said, shit, I didn't even hang up the phone. Boom! Yeah. <laughs> Flew my ass out of there, man. Time was bad. I'm like, Kenny, yeah. tell you you ought not be there. You ain't gonna be there. Right. And so I split, man. That's when I had to go underground. I ended up living in Cleveland for about a year. Okay. Years time. And, and the only reason they come after me 
was because I was doing five years probation for carrying concealed weapons in an automobile in the 66 riots. Mm -hmm. And they knew that uh, by, by uh, this injunction, I would violate my paper and they could send me up for the five. Uh, so that's why I had to split. And I went on to Cleveland, man, and I lived down there for about a year until Kenny got on. I had the coolest probation officer you ever seen. He hated everybody downtown. Yeah. He just waiting for it. He was writing me up like I'm coming to visit him every week. <laughs> I've yeah. been gone a year. <laughs> you know, and uh, so when I got back, man, uh, I went on finished out my probation and stuff. But, but that's why I had to go on the ground for that year. Yeah. We lost a lot of ground while I was gone that year because okay. we ended up going a different kind of direction than I think we would have went had I could have stayed. But uh, yeah. the, the people that was back here had to take up the slack, you know, because I, yeah. could, I couldn't do nothing with it. But that was, that was when I went underground that year. Okay. Um, describe the situation that you had, you had spoke a little bit about when you said you were locked up in a, you were in the police station with some other guys and the mayor came in. Yeah, uh, at the Dodge main plant, uh, we had a trustee that died. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, th this was in Hamtramck. We had three trustees and all of them was Polish. So a trustee died, so we decided to run, our, run Ron Marsh. We decided to run a candidate. So Ron Marsh and Chuck Wooten, two of the two our guys, flipped a coin and Ron won. Mm -hmm. So Ron, Ron Marsh became our candidate. So we, we jump in the race, we make some great big posters like that. A rhyme blowing on a bullhorn in an alley, and we started yeah. campaigning with that stuff all over the plant, man. And the, and the plant manager now started tearing it down. We put it back up. Yeah. Uh, anyway, on, on election day, uh, Ron came in first that time, mm -hmm. uh, 521 votes. Uh, and so then they came after us to, to mobilize to, to stop us from, from taking it on. So when the next election opened up, uh, the, the police department harassed us all day long. We had about a 45 minute, uh, we had about a, uh, like a 440 run down the street to the, to the local hall. We had guys jumping in the back end of pickup trucks and shit, going down there to vote before they go to work. You know, so they, the police harassed us all day and we got down, we went down to the local hall and then run the police, uh, the police chief and the mayor of the city in the, in the thing, talk about we're we gonna stop this mess y'all doing and uh, I blah, 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 and uh, we look up and here come 50 policemen through the door with axe handles and swinging them and shit, so we in there boxing yeah. in the police department. We ain't got our ass whooped, try to jump in the, in the girls' lavatory behind the toilet or something to keep getting whooped. Man, they, they had a field day on us, so, so that was our experience. Now, we couldn't understand why we would get that much static from uh, election of a trustee, but you know what it was? They was taking uh, union dues from Dodge Main Local 3 and lending it to the Highland Park City uh, to help pay the police and fire department when the money went low. And the reason they could do it, because these three Polish trustees was the only ones to sign this show. And that's when we came up with the title to that movie. We finally got the news how our dues are being used. You know, they're paying the police for our union dues. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's that story. Man. So how important was Kenny Cockrell to the two? Kenny was really important, man, because, and not just because Kenny was Kenny, but Kenny sparked a whole another group of lawyers to stand up and start taking up labor cases. You know, and so it changed the whole climate of what we were able to do and not do in a legal sense. You know, so he was really important in that sense. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, this is a really important one. Mm -hmm. So what lessons can workers in, in labor unions learn today uh, from the experiences of, of, of drum? Well, I, 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 don't know, I don't know what they can learn. Uh, one, one of the reasons that we, one, one, of the, one of the lessons that we had to learn was that uh, we decided to go after the factories uh, because after the 67 rebellion in Detroit and, uh, and, and people were placed on curfew, and if you got sick, you couldn't go to the hospital. If you got hungry, you couldn't go get no food. But if you had a badge from Chrysler, Ford, or General Motors, 
You get through the Army line, the police line, the National Guard line, state police line, and take your butt to work. <laughs> so when we sit down analyzing what happened in the rebellion, the, the summary we made was the only place that black people had any value in society was at the point of production. So that's when we decided we're going to organize these factories. We're going to turn our face to the factories. And in nine months, drum was born. So we had that strategy to look forward to. That's why I can't just say that we should do this here or do that there. You, you need to analyze your situation, see what your strong points is and their weak points are, and then strike, you yeah. know, attack it, go after it, or whatever you got to do. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's why we, we went after the factories to organize.